Women in Partner webinar. This is Sally Frank, and on behalf of the entire board, we are thrilled to have you here with us today as we work together to inspire and elevate women in STEM. Before we get started, just a few quick notes. This meeting is being recorded, so if you would prefer not to be a part of our recording, please disconnect and you can listen to an archive version of the webinar on our YouTube channel. In fact, all of our previous webinars are there, so check it out when you can. We'll give you the link at the end of the um, session today. Also, as we go through today's presentation, please feel free to post questions or comments in the chat window, and we'll try to address them as we go. We often get a lot of good comments and uh, really good ways of discussing issues that way. Also, we ask that you make sure your microphone is on mute until we open things up for questions at the end. So thanks for being with us today. So I'd like to take just a moment and give you a little bit of information about our speaker, Glenn Combs. First, I'd like to recognize the fact that Glenn is our first male speaker in this series, so hats off to him. And he's a partner at Crow Horwath, an accounting firm and Microsoft partner. We recruited Glenn for this series when we read about his diversity and inclusion work in an article published last October. For several years, Glenn has been a diversity and inclusion ally. He has mentored young African-American males and entrepreneurs in his community, sharing advice on how to run their businesses, while also learning about their experiences and understanding some of the challenges that they faced. Recently, Glenn joined Crow's African-American People Resource Network to help further understand the situation of his colleagues and to serve as a mentor to others at Crow Horwath with different backgrounds than his own. So now I will turn things over to our esteemed guest speaker, Glenn. Thank you, Sally. So why is it so challenging for me to have consistent and meaningful relationships with people who aren't like me? I just gave it back accidentally, Sally. So I will continue That's to talk. Okay. Yeah, can um, Jody, can you go ahead and share again? Hang on, folks. We're getting there. Apologies. No problem. I just needed to delay for a few minutes. All right. So I'll take over, and then I will be very cautious as to where my fingers land on the mouse. All right. So something that I wanted to share, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. But the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is creation of the beloved community. It's this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. It's this type of understanding, goodwill, that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It's this love which will bring about miracles in the hearts of men. So why do I have these challenges? Is it because I feel threatened? Because I don't understand them? Because people don't understand me? Am I intimidated? For now, let's just say I'm in the box. Whether it's a gender identity issue, different color, different beliefs, many of us are intimidated when we come face to face with our own biases. Good morning. I'm Glenn Combs. This is me. I want to thank you for choosing some time to spend some time with me today. I am honored that Sally asked me to speak to Microsoft and Women and Partner. And I'll openly admit that I'm intimidated. I'm not a professional speaker, not a psychologist, I'm not a social worker, I'm not a guru of any kind. But why am I intimidated? I'm a 56-year-old Caucasian partner in a global CPA firm. How could I be intimidated? What biases am I holding on to? So that's me, Glenn Combs, CPA, husband of Jamie Combs, CPA. I'm a partner with Crow Horwath, LLP. Guess what? We're a CPA firm. It's my dog, Baxter. He's big. And he can be intimidating. 
unfortunately, I've had people say the same thing about me. So, why am I intimidated today? Well, I prefer to see the audience. I sometimes try to be funny, and I was told by my son, Dad, no humor. I'm speaking to a large group of professional females, most of whom know more about technology than me. And as Sally mentioned earlier, I'm the first male speaker for your group. So what biases, what intimidations do we deal with? I can almost assure you that as I talk about this today, that I'm going to say something that will reveal biases within me and that may be offensive. I'm not trying to do that. In fact, I try very hard not to. But if I do, I apologize for it in advance. And what I'd ask from you is that if you hear something out of me that you think shows a bias, first of all, give me grace, but let me know. At the end, you'll see my contact information. So what do we have in common? I believe we're all here to learn. I really do wish we were in a traditional forum where we could hear through more than our words. We also have in common the Microsoft affiliation. I've been a Microsoft partner since founding my company in 1991. Uh, since April of last year, I've been a partner in Crow Horwath, which is the eighth largest CPA firm in the United States. I had grown my, my business to about 40 people. We were located in Lexington, Kentucky uh, at my age. I was looking at you know, where we go from here, what's the succession plan, and some of you who are with partners may be doing the exact same thing. And I was approached by Crow Horwath about becoming part of the firm, and uh, over the course of about six or eight months, uh, we worked through the opportunity, and I'm, I'm proud to now say, and my wife says it like this, that it took me 34 years to become a partner in a big age CPA firm. So as part of Crow, I continue to represent Microsoft, one of the greatest technology organizations in the world. I practice within Crow's risk business unit, and I specialize in cybersecurity, leading our Lexington, Kentucky office, and our managed security services solutions. I live in Lexington, Kentucky. I'm guessing not many of you have been here. Maybe there are some of you who are here today. Uh, if you have been here, Great. You know that Central Kentucky is also known as the Bluegrass. It's the home of the fastest thoroughbreds, the best bourbon, and it's March Madness. So, of course, it's the center of Big Blue Nation. So I have a few objectives today. They're on the slide. I want us to acknowledge that we're all intimidated in some way. I want us to acknowledge that we're all holding biases. I want to share some resources that I've used I wouldn't say for overcoming, I don't like the way I put that, but for battling the intimidation and bias that exists in my life. I'd like to acknowledge that we all have things we need to unlearn. And if I can inspire you to do one thing, to continue to do, to inspire others, no matter their gender identity, their, their color, their religion, their political, their sexual preference, then today, I think our time would have been successful. Really, no ground rules. I do want to encourage you to participate. And uh, you do that through IM, and we'll try to keep an eye on those. Sally if, uh, or Jody, if I miss something, please don't hesitate to uh, to just interrupt me and say, hey, Glenn, let's, we got a question. Let's answer it. Okay. And uh, from there, I just want to talk a little bit about my story and hopefully give you an opportunity to maybe share some of yours and your questions. So, so during the past several years leading up to joining Crow Horwath, I spent a lot of my time and efforts devoted to leadership and development within my company. It really became a passion for me, and our company created a culture that, that was really grounded in gaining a better understanding of ourselves and our teams and our strengths. Everyone in our company was introduced to Strength Finder and the Strength Finder assessment from Gallup. Uh, I would venture to say many of you have taken this, and 
maybe know your top five off the top of your head. I know I do. We actually had these on our business card for a while. I won't go into the detail, but my top five are maximizer, developer, empathy, ideation, and activator. It's outside of the scope of today to really talk a lot about strings, but if you've taken String Finder, you probably know that there's a dark side to undeveloped strings. So my second one, developer, is you see the potential in others. Very often, in fact, potential is all you see. So the dark side of this, I think my kids phrased it best. You can never please dad. And that was something that, that I really had to work through, even with kids in their 20s, that I had to understand and help them begin to understand more about me and how I could take that dark side of you can't please dad and do something with it. So through that initiative, I've been able to see many people overcome self-confidence issues, relationship challenges, financial setbacks, and unconscious biases that have allowed them to, to really advance their professional and personal lives. As an outgrowth of the internal program, um, as I grew my understanding of, of great leaders and how they contribute to the development and growth of those around them, I, I found myself presented with an opportunity to expand my personal focus to gain a, a greater understanding of diversity and bias within my community, my church, my business, within the world. And this was an intimidating opportunity to realize that in your 50s that you have biases that are holding you back or that are offending other people um, is hard. It's intimidating. Um, as I said earlier, I'm 56 years old. I grew up in a community that was probably 80% Caucasian, 19% African American, and 1% everybody else. And it's probably appropriate that the name of the town was Hazard, Kentucky. Half of my family was, was clearly racist. Half of my family was clearly not. I had a core group of friends that, that included a few African Americans, but outside of them, I was intimidated by black people. Uh, why? Because I never sought to understand. Today, Largely as a result of my family's membership in a multi-ethnic church, I actively participate, as Sally said, in mentoring young African-American and Caucasian men. My wife and I spend significant time with, with couples and mentoring them and just being there for them. I'm also on the leadership team for Crow's African-American People Resource Network, and, and I'm really pumped about this June being able to attend for the first time the National Association of Black Accountants Conference, NABA. None of this would have been possible without the realization through the assistance, push, love of numerous people that I was at least biased, if not a racist, something of which there's no way you could convince me of just a few short years ago. I wasn't avert. I wasn't making racist, sexist comments. I had friends of color, but until I finally sought to understand them, I had no idea that I was biased with regards to people who weren't like me. So I had to begin to understand. In order to grow beyond my biases, I had to seek to understand about other people, about those who don't look like me. And that's a long and intimidating journey. It's long and intimidating whether you're seeking to understand another color, another gender, another belief. And it, it takes you to a lot of places. It took me to a lot of places mentally and physically that were uncomfortable. But that's the key. I had conversations that were often awkward and clumsy. But because I had people who cared about me and who did not judge me, the road's been enlightening and rewarding. Without them, I don't know that I would have been at Crow Horwath, and I certainly know I wouldn't be speaking to you all today. 
So let me introduce you to just a few very special people in my life who helped me to go where I am today, and I still got a long way to go. I'll continue to lean into these people, and I'll encourage you to continue to lean into people that you have in your lives who bring a similar value to you. So Jamie, my wife of almost 30 years, was our CFO until we sold our business to Crow last April. She has an amazing heart and an open door for young people who need to know that someone loves them and cares about their growth. She has many conversations over the fruits of one of her favorite activities, baking desserts. My daughter Whitley worked with us for several years and is now pursuing her master's in social work. Whitley's passionate about underserved children, finding a way to impact those threatened by our drug epidemic. Whitley lights up the room and can make friends with a wall. Taylor, my son, is a Christian book publisher and is obtaining his master's in divinity. His wife, Lindsay Latimer, and it's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y-L-A-T-I-M-E-R. If you want to invest a few books, few bucks in her music, um, he has a heart for diversity, and, and he really is a young man. He's 25 years old now. Led the challenge for my family to become more aware of our own biases and to do something about them. Larry is my African-American trainer. He's my little brother and someone who has really joined this journey with me. He seeks to understand me just as intentionally and intensely as I him. The advantage he has is that he can tell me to get in the floor and do 50 push-ups and laugh at me while he's investing in me. The others, my good friends Jimmy Carter, Jonathan Smith, and J.T. Eldridge, who are three leaders in our church, and are devoted to racial reconciliation. And they all subscribe to and introduced me to Strength Finder program to lead people to a better understanding of themselves as they seek to understand others. And then, lastly, certainly not least, my good friends and co-workers, Andre, Regina, and Sonia, all African Americans who have shown a desire to not only be understood, but to understand. I've been so fortunate to have many uncomfortable conversations with them, and I receive new wisdom and perspective every time I have one of those conversations. Through those conversations and with other people who I know, sometimes with an occasional stranger, Uber drivers are, are the best. Um, I've just begun to understand what it's like for an African-American, in this case, to be pulled over by a police car, to try and obtain a loan to start a business, what it's like to be a biracial family, what it's like to choose who to vote for in an election, and how to enter into a profession where there are few people like them. I don't think I would have ever recognized the limitations. I have a, a friend, African-American friend, who is an architect, and I believe the membership of the uh, association, which he is a member, is about 3% African-American. The uh, partners in large CPA firms, I, I don't know the, the statistics, but I would venture to um, say that it's probably one, less than 1% minority as partners in large CPA firms. So, hey, hey Glenn. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. We're getting some questions asking if we're still on the uh, top five slide because they think they should be seeing pictures of these people who have inspired you. I did not put pictures in. I apologize. Okay. And uh, that would have been a great thing to do. And uh, so uh, I'll move on to the next slide. But for... Um, for my next update, they will be there. Thanks for that suggestion. So what biases do you folks hold? Are they gender identity? Are they color, religion, politics, sexual preference? Maybe they're more subtle. Were you born with biases? Doubtful. Were they part of your upbringing? At least some of them. They were for me. Did they develop because of your life experiences? Most certainly. As women in technology, I know, I know that you've experienced discrimination and injustice as you've grown in your profession. Because I've been there, I've watched it, 
and I assure you I've contributed to your challenges in part of my 26 years. Make no mistake, I've known many successful females in this industry, successful consultants, CFOs, engineers, salespeople, managers, business owners. But you know, I've also seen females leave the industry because of roadblocks and rejection based on discrimination and carried out with intimidation. I apologize for being there and not doing something about it. As I thought and, and prepared for today, I reached out to several successful female friends, family members, acquaintances, in an effort to understand their challenges. They're from different industries. Two of them have been extremely successful in technology. Here's what I heard. Successful female salesperson at Salesforce, who's about my age, told me that she didn't initially have any problems. It was smooth sailing. She had a business degree. She grew up in technology in Boston. She was ambitious, driving, competing, and she was winning. Her challenges began when two things happened. She started having children, and when other people started thinking she was rising too quickly. To, her, to quote her, when men found out how much money I was making, they had a cow. She lost three jobs because she made too much money. Today, she talks about the challenges her son faces because he's a young white male. Does that really exist? Is that a possible bias that we don't think about very often? She also shared something with me that was interesting, that there's a fundamental difference in approach that she believes has held back women from progressing in the technology industry. She believes that when a man sees a job opening, he doesn't care if he's missing some of the job criteria. He'll apply if he meets one out of five criteria, while females won't generally apply unless they meet all the criteria. So a second person in technology I spoke to is a, a very successful female CIO who I know. And she doesn't think of herself as a female, but as a business person. She's led males most of her professional life becoming a supervisor after two years. And when she first moved into that role, every single man reporting to her came to her and said, it's not because you're a woman, but I want to be transferred. She recalls the advice that her father gave her when she called her, called him one afternoon. If you don't, if they don't want to be led by you, let them go and find those who do. Much like other Biases she believes early exposure would make a difference. I say often say we have to start with the children. And that's what she's saying. We have to start early. In the case, in this case, early exposure, professional opportunities in technology, in the same way that NABA is working hard to expose young African Americans to careers in accounting. We have to start early. We must be willing to commit to and participate and difficult conversations in order to understand the failures of overcoming bias in our society. From this point on, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is derived from Stephen Covey, is derived from the Arbinger Institute, but it's, it's, it's derived from my personal experiences and what I've seen in life. And many of you, this will resonate with you because you've seen the same type of events and the same type of biases. So we're going to talk hey, about. Glenn? Yes. Be before you go on, could you kind of share how you would like start that difficult conversation? I mean, you know, if, if you've been in a situation, if you feel you've been wronged or you've seen other people being wronged, how do you kind of do it in a way that is um, constructive and uh, the person doesn't necessarily uh, become defensive? So that's a, a great question. And, and there's a concept that, that my wife and I like to use. And it's, it's coming from a low pedestal. It's coming from a, a place of humility. Um, 
I don't know how many conversations I've started in my career with, well, why did you do that? Or you did that wrong. Or you're really making me mad. But add some other language in there. And as, as you, um, here are some of the things I'll talk about with, with Stephen Covey and seeking to understand and, and with being in the box of leadership and self-deception. It, it's first to come from a low pedestal, to come with humility and to acknowledge that I might be hearing something wrong. I don't understand maybe what you're telling me. Can you help me to understand? And I think what I found is that, that people appreciate someone who's willing to say, I messed up. You know, I may have caused this and I need you to help me. They want to rescue you. So I think, I hope that answered your question. I, I think coming in from that low pedestal uh, is great. I actually looked for where I found that concept a few years ago, and I couldn't find it. I would have put that in here, and if I do find it, I'll get it out. But if you just remember that, come low, not high. So, thank you. And, and we've got to be willing to – go ahead. I was just saying thank you. Oh, oh thank you. All right. So we, we must be willing to commit to and participate in these conversations in order to understand the failures that we have. Wherever the, the, the challenge is, wherever the bias is, whether it's a different color or, or a coworker who you believe is, is being disrespectful because, because you're female or a friend with whom you disagree or your spouse or your significant other, you gotta go there. You've gotta risk asking awkward questions and saying dumb things that expose your ignorance. So what biases do you all hold? What, what do you acknowledge? Do you believe they're damaging? Do you want to overcome them? Um, do you ever face intimidation because of your gender? Do you, do you ever try to intimidate in return? Do you hold biases because others are biased towards you? I do. I grew up in Hazard, Kentucky. If you look up Hillbilly on the Internet, you probably will find Hazard, Kentucky. If you look up my last name in Hazard, Kentucky, it might even get better. So I grew up with biases, and I've had biases toward me. Intimidation, conflicts, differing beliefs, all these represent opportunities to grow. Yeah, they hinder our imagination because we tend to only be concerned about our immediate interests. If you only see these opportunities as chances to win or lose, and choices and growth will be limited. And you'll constantly find yourself, to go back to what I said earlier, coming in from a high pedestal, and people are going to recoil. And they're going to go in the box, which I'll talk about in a moment, with you. So how can we transcend the limits of our own biases and those we encounter so that, that we can deeply communicate and cooperatively deal with the issues we face in our personal and professional lives? I think it was Covey that said, Viva la difference. Overcoming bias requires us to think about things that aren't already on our mind, to think differently. I believe that before we can grow from the opportunities presented by different beliefs, we've got to follow what Stephen Covey's wisdom presented way back in 1989. We've got to seek first to understand, then to be understood then we must explore shared interest, whether it be with a business partner or a spouse or significant other. Shared interests lie latent in every conflict. Finding them and stressing them can be the beginning of the growth and removal of bias. So the theme today could have been seek first to understand, but I'm not sure that would have attracted the attendance that we've got. There are some tips from Covey from 89, but if you haven't read The Seven Habits recently, I recommend you go back and do it again. One of my partners suggested this to me seven or eight or nine months ago. I'd read it probably 15 years ago, and it's amazing what I got by going back. And to many, Habit 5 
seek first to understand is really the most exciting and most immediately applicable of the seven habits. So as Kelly says, communication is the most important skill in life. I agree with him, but I qualify and say it's only effective if your communication is done out of the box. And I'll elaborate on that later. If it's manipulative, if it's a skill that you're practicing, uh, if it's evident that you're not listening and communicating with empathy, it's a weapon, and it's not the skill that you should be using. I'm not sure. I'm sure all of us know the answer to this. I think I've got it on the screen. But our communication is 10% words, 30% sound, and 60% body language. That's why the web meetings are tough for me. We can hear and read most of our words. I can even inflect emotion in my, my voice. But without body language, we're guaranteed that 60% of our communication is not getting through. So these, these critical conversations, these uncomfortable conversations, grab somebody that, that you know has a different perspective and buy them a cup of coffee, buy them lunch, buy them 20 cups of coffee and 20 lunches, but sit down face to face and, and, and communicate. The real key to our influence is our actual conduct. And that's in its simplest form what I mean when I refer, refer to out of the box. A big indicator of our conduct is displayed in how we listen. Are we ignoring? Are we pretending? Are we selectively listening? I'll bet that a few of us get accused of that. I know I get accused of that at home more often than I would like to admit. Are we attentively listening? Or are we at the highest level empathically listening? Listening with intent to understand. Empathic listening is, is the key. It's the key to deposits in the emotional bank account. Do you listen with empathy when you have a conflict with your spouse, your significant other, your child, your coworker, or someone else with whom you have a conflict? If there could be a show of hands right now, uh, I would ask how many of you just today have had conversations where you did not listen with empathy? Know that next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological survival. To be understood, to be affirmed, to be validated, and be appreciated. Imagine your own world if somehow you could have these meaningful, difficult conversations which lead to just overcoming one, bi one bias, one prejudice, or one intimidation. Do you believe that if we're biased, we're depositing into the emotional bank account? Do you believe that when my African-American friend Larry, when I ask him the question, how do you feel when you're getting pulled over by a police car? He told me he was scared. Do you think that if I said, Larry, well, what would you do to get pulled over? That I'm listening with empathy, that I'm adding to my emotional bank account with him. If we really seek to understand without hypocrisy, without guile, there'll be times when we'll be stunned with the knowledge and understanding that flows from truly listening to another person. When we learn to listen deeply, we'll discover tremendous differences in perception. Differences that exist despite the fact that we both lived with presumably the same facts for years. And we've regularly questioned the character of those who can't see them the same way. Differences that, when understood, can lead to new relationships. They can lead to mended feelings, more successful marriages, families, businesses, and careers. So now I want to talk a little bit about concept that th this book is one of the most powerful books I've ever read, Leadership and Self-Deception. You've heard me talk about In the Box. When I started to understand, I use that word a lot today, when I, when I realized that 
I wasn't seeking to understand. I also realized I tied all this together. It was because I'm in this box. And I'll talk about that. As business leaders, community leaders, we have to be passionate in our leadership in the battle against bias. I said that before. I'll say it again. While we do not have to believe in all causes, I don't have to agree. Okay. But I must work to understand them and create an environment or culture that supports diversity, diversity, inclusion, and the opportunities that they present. I've spoken about understanding. We have to understand our own biases and how they manifest themselves. Now we can move beyond the limitations they create. As we know, the most prevalent bias in our country today is racism. Sadly, many of us believe if we don't look like someone else, then they're inferior to us. History has and continues to prove that racial divide is the most damaging of all biases. I recently began reading Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Where Do We Go From Here? It was written in 1967, and it could have been written this year. So sadly that, that many of the same problems, results of rise of bias and racism, still exist today. So I talked about the box. What does in the box mean anyway? Well, in the box is a metaphor for resisting others. It's really pretty simple. It's knowing what you should do for others and choosing not to act accordingly. Let's do some exploring. And as a resource for those wanting to discover more about it, I highly recommend reading Leadership and Self-Deception by the Arbinger Institute. I won't do it at all justice. The power that's revealed this in this book is, is life-changing, life-transforming. Please read it. My wife and I have, have both read it multiple times. We listen to it. And when we're traveling at times, it is a powerful concept. What does it mean to be in the box? For our purposes, let's just say that in the box is the inability to see that one has a problem with how they see other people. Choosing to see themselves, no, sorry, choosing to see them, the other people, as objects instead of people. That's self-deception. We see others as less than they are, as objects with needs and desires, somehow less important and even less legitimate than our own. Self-betrayal is how we get in the box in the first place. Over time, as, as we betray ourselves repeatedly, we come to see ourselves in various self-justifying ways. We carry those images into new situations, and we enter new situations already in this box. Principles of self-betrayal, self I'll go back. Uh, an act contrary to what I feel I should do for another. There's a story in the book about the author being on a plane and sitting in a seat, and he was, um, the seat next to him, he was in a window window seat, and the seat beside him was empty, and he put his briefcase in it, and he started reading his paper, and the, the, the plane was pretty full. People would walk by, and they would look at that seat, and uh, he would not look up, so he, he wanted to protect that seat. So he was, with regards to, to that behavior, he was he was in the box. He goes on to tell the story an example of outside the box is the next time he flew, he and his wife were together, and they didn't have seats together. And a lady in the back of the plane uh, realized what was going on, got up and said, hey, there's an empty seat beside me. I'd be glad to take one of yours. He was in the box. She became out of the box. So these principles of self-betrayal hold true. It's an act. Contrary to what I feel I should do for another, when I betray myself, again, I begin to see the world in a way that justifies what I'm doing. When I see the world in a self-justifying way, my view of reality becomes distorted. So when I betray myself, I enter this box. And over time, certain boxes become my character, and I carry them with me. And I provoke others to be in the box. In the box, in the, in the box we invite mutual mistreatment. 
and obtain mutual justification, collusion in the way we do things. When we're out of the box and we're seeing others as people, we have a very basic sense about those people. Namely, that like ourselves, they have hopes, needs, cares, fears, and on occasion, as a result of this sense, we have impressions of things to do for others. Things we might help with, things we can do for them, things we want to do for them. When I have that sense of what other people might need, now I can help them, and then I choose to do against it, then I betray my own sense of what I should do for someone. If I betray myself, then I start seeing things differently. My view of others, my circumstances, myself, everything's distorted in a way that, that makes me okay because I've justified what I'm doing. If it's that plain seat, I justified it because I had a briefcase and I was tired and I didn't want someone sitting beside me. I didn't want to talk to someone. So self-betrayal happens in a way that's represented by the box on the screen. There, there are behaviors that exist and, and your, your response to behaviors is feeling. You recognize that something needs to be done for someone and you don't do it. Or you choose, you, you have a choice at that point. You, you can choose to do it or honor it and you're out of the box or you can choose to betray it and be in the box. So we're in a culture today where people live way too much in the box. We seek to blame and blame is one of the fastest ways to get in the box. We seek we seek to be justified. We need people to cause trouble for us. Normally, we spend a lot of time in the box trying to change others. That doesn't work. And I'll tell you a story in a minute. Here's a list of things that don't work in the box. Trying to change others. How many times have you tried to change someone and it just doesn't work? Beginning to cope with them. Leaving them. Trying to communicate with them without empathy, trying to implement new skills or techniques, or trying to change my own behavior. So here's how I betrayed myself. My nephew, Davey, was 46 years old. I kept feeling I should pick up the phone and keep picking up the phone until he responded to me. But I didn't. I went in the box. I started to see Davy, who had gone down a wrong path, as hopeless, as a manipulator, as a waste of my time, as a liar, as someone who blamed others, as someone who was unwilling to change. I justified it. I saw myself as fully invested. I've been trying. I've tried my hardest. I've been manipulated. I've been a good uncle. I've been a supporter. He used to work for me. I blame him. I'm his target. I tried to change him. It didn't work. I betrayed myself because I chose to stay in the box. On New Year's Eve, 2017, I lost my nephew Davy to a heroin overdose. So the moment that I see another person with needs, hopes, and worries that are as real and legitimate as my own, I'm out of the box. I didn't let myself go there with him. So during early February, I was on a call with leadership of our African American People Resources Network. It was early in Black History Month. And one of our leaders asked others, all African Americans, I'm the only Caucasian on the leadership of, of the PRN, was asked, what do you do as part of the celebration? And several people mentioned spending time with and talking to their children about the oppression of African Americans. 
after stories by, by several people, I issued you to challenge. What I said was something along the lines of, I applaud you for providing this education to your children. Don't ever stop doing that. Now I'll go out and find someone who looks more like me and have a conversation about racism and oppression and prejudice in our world. Step out of your comfort zone and make a difference in someone's life who might not realize that they're biased. Do it in a way that's out of your box, and you will help them get out of their box. That, my friends, is my challenge to you. Thanks so much for your time and attention, Sally, for the invite. Uh, as I asked you earlier, if, if you recognize biases in me, please let me know. If you want to share a story or want to bounce an idea off of me, you know where to find me. There's my contact information. Thank you, Glenn. That was um, quite uh, different for us, and I think really an interesting perspective. Um, I wanted to ask you, and, and thank you for sharing the story about your nephew, Davey, because I know that's got to be kind of a painful episode um, in your life. But it seems to me that there must have been um, a moment or peer, perhaps a series of moments that led to this opening of your eyes in which you felt you were or had been biased. Was there some kind of significant emotional event or, or, or something that kind of led you down that path that you had not, um, you know, what was it that kind of all of a sudden opened your eyes if it was one event or a series of events? And by the way, in case you haven't seen it, we've got uh, several comments um, uh, in the chat window about uh, the appreciation for sharing your perspective, um, one of which says, uh, I wish more of us would be honest with ourselves. Yeah, isn't that the holy grail? But anyway, is there is there a series of emotional events or something um, quintessential that kind of opened your eyes to, to what you had been doing? Sally, I, I think that's... Um and I, I would say a series, but, but the thing that probably jumped out at me uh, as much as anything is uh, when my son, who was probably um, 19, 20 at the time, uh, he, he was a blogger. Uh, he wrote a blog that said, I may be a racist. And it, it, it really hit home. Uh, I would have never thought that uh, that my family would have uh, have been racist. I mean, again, as I said earlier, there weren't jokes, there weren't uh, degrading comments. I had African American friends, um, but he really placed the challenge on my heart to to understand that you could do all that and and still not understand and still be racist. So I, I think that began this journey for me and, and it really is kind of like peeling back the onion the more you peel it back you know the, uh, I'll make this up the stinkier it gets <laughs> and um, and I look at, at that also I think I shared with you a story uh, of, of a number of years ago when um, I was in a, an awkward situation and uh, the uh, COO of, of a client was a female and I handled it very, very poorly. Uh, I, I, I sat in a room and and just kind of almost brooded, all right, I, and because there was a competitor that it brought in. And there were other things around that, but um, and, and shortly thereafter, uh, I had, I was in an organization called Vistage. If you are uh, in a partner organization, and you uh, are, are business owner or executive level, uh, I would highly, highly encourage you to explore Vistage International. It's a CEO group, and it, it's of your peers. And, and I had a, a group of about 15 in Lexington who I was very close to. And uh, each month you meet, and uh, I think in nine out of 12 months you have a speaker. And there was uh, a speaker shortly after that that particular meeting, and her name was um, Gwen Rennick, I believe. She was a uh, former co-host of PM Magazine in Denver, Colorado. And her, her niche, if you will, was uh, public speaking and 
Um, the words are escaping right, me right now, but but basically uh, she worked with us on you know, how to interact with people. And, and I remember uh, role playing and the opportunity that I had to, to share my story about that very awkward meeting with my client. And, and uh, I stood up in front of this group and she said, let's role play. And I had, uh, <laughs> I never forget, I had on a black turtleneck and a black sports coat. And I'm about six feet one and I weigh about 235 pounds there on a, on a bad day. And she said, you're intimidating. And, uh, it, it just kind of went from there. From that perspective, I realized that, that I, I was trying to be intimidating. And, uh, so I, I would say those couple of things, um, and, and you know, just as you, as you grow in age, you grow in wisdom, hopefully. And, and, um, so I would say those were two of the transformational events in, in my life that, that have kind of put me at this spot. And I, I look forward to retirement because this is something I want to do. I want to work with young people, and I love working with young people and, and mentoring them. So uh, hopefully Thank that answered you. your question. Yeah, it did. Thanks, Glenn. So let's um, take a few moments and open it up um, if there's anyone in the uh, in the Skype meeting that would like to pose a question directly. Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and talk to Glenn directly or type it in the chat window if that's more comfortable for you. Anyone? Well, okay. Sally, you have my, my email address on the screen and my Twitter uh, handle. I'm not a terribly active Twitter person, for lack of a Twitterer. I don't know the right word. Uh, but I do. I check it every day, and, and occasionally I'll put something out there. So please don't hesitate to connect there or on LinkedIn, and um, be, be glad to to chat with anyone who might want to. Great, thank you so much. Really appreciate the um, the candor and the stories and uh, the perspective. It's it's quite unique, and um, I think it was a great way to introduce some men into our sleeping into our speaking lineup. Um, so as we kind of close out, just want to remind everybody that this will be posted to our YouTube channel and our LinkedIn group, um, along with all the others that we've had in the past. Our next webinar is scheduled for April 3rd, and our speaker will be Allison Saltzer, who's a Microsoft IoT partner sales executive, and she will talk on cultivating executive presence. So. Um, kind of on the heels of, uh, of letting go of your bias, how can you uh, then improve how you appeal um, and appear to others? So um, we hope you'll join us for that. With that, I think we can stop the recording and close out the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and thanks special to, uh, to Glenn.